more and have more of it. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, I'm probably not alone in that. We, uh, that, that's the reason why we're here is to, to spread God's word. And upon that note, that's kind of what is we are going and taking a look at a little bit today. Uh, today we are going to be continuing in the book of Romans chapter 12. And we are going to be talking about enacting God's will. Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 8. And you may be looking at this and saying, wait a minute, this looks awfully familiar because we have covered it. As a matter of fact, we covered it um, about a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago after we had uh, formally organized. Uh, I went through and, and preached a couple of messages on uh, church, and this is one of the ones that kind of fell in that mix. And so uh, you may be thinking, oh, okay, so, uh, you know, you're trying to take it easy and have a repeat. Well, no, not really. Uh, um, you know, we're going through the book of Romans uh, from chapters 12, uh, hopefully to the end of the, the book. And so this is part of it. And uh, at the same time, this is kind of an important thing that we need to, to know. And so uh, whether you have forgotten it and you, you, you know you need a, a refresher on it, maybe you've never heard it before, or if you have remember it, you, you, you've heard it, it'd be a good thing for you to be reminded about. Um, and that is that, uh, you know, last week what we did was we took a look at knowing God's will. Um, but knowing God's will is good and great and fine. However, if we don't do something with it, then it's not going to do any good for us. We need to enact God's will in our lives in order for it to really do anything um, that's important. You know, knowing God's will and not doing anything with it really is just as, as uh, akin, in fact, it may even be worse uh, than not knowing God's will. Uh, you know, if we know what God's will is for our lives, then we need to put it into action. We need to do it. And when we talk about enacting God's will, I think that sometimes that may seem very daunting. Uh, like, for example, you know, the last song that we sang, and uh, when you think about, uh, like, fulfilling the Great Commission, you think, well, I don't know that I can do that. I, I, I don't know that I can go and spread the gospel to all the world um, like what the Great Commission wants us to do. And so when we look at it in that regard, we may think that it really is a very big, daunting task. Um, but really, what we need to be focusing on is not necessarily the big picture. What we need to be focusing on is just simply what our part in the big picture is. Let's let God focus on the big picture because He can do that and He can take care of it. But instead, if we'll just simply focus on what our part is of enacting God's will, Will, then when we all do it and we all do it together, then we can see that, that God's will really can be done. God's will can be accomplished here on this earth. So having said all that, let's take a look at Romans chapter 12 uh, and we're going to read verses 3 through 8. <clears throat> so in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3, it says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form all the others, or, or um, uh, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others." We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. It is serving, let him serve. It is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And so here we are talking about enacting God's will. And the first thing that we need to understand is that enacting God's will is really done through us. Now, if you recall last week, what we talked about was understanding and approving and knowing God's will. And we talked a little bit about what all of that was. And if you recall, God's will is nothing more than just simply what 
God wants. And so we, we use that word will in there uh, and we don't really, you know, we kind of lose sight about what that word and the definition is. Will is want. And so God's will is just what God wants. And that's, that's all that there is to it. Um, now, in what God wants, we can kind of break things down a little bit. And that is that there's times that God is going to do what he wants and he himself is going to act and accomplish it. And you can say that this is God's sovereign will. But there's other times that God, because he has given mankind a free will, the choice, he just simply says, this is what I want you to do. And it's our responsibility to either go and do it or it's our responsibility to not do it. And in that, we can see that there's the, his general will, and that is it's God's will applied to every single person on this earth. Uh, when we think about God's will um, and what God wants, uh, here it is, the Word of God. And so, you know, um, we may say that specifically, we may not really know what God wants somebody else to do, you know, and, and specifically, it could be that God is leading you to do one thing, but leading somebody else to do something else. But at the same time, what we need to understand is that everybody, doesn't matter who they are, everybody falls under what God's Word says. And so if you want to know what God's will is for our lives, what we have to do is we need to look at, at, at the, the Bible right here. And so in verse number 9, for example, where it says, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That is attributable to every single person, whether you are, uh, you, you know, old, young, whatever. It, it, it doesn't matter. That it, it, it works for me. It works for you. And so you can't come up and say, well, you know what? Um, God may want you to do verse number nine, but he doesn't want me to do verse number nine. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. And so, yes, there are specific things that God wants from each and every one of us. Yes, God does lead us into different things, but it all has to fall under that general umbrella. Now, this passage of Scripture is really talking about how God is going to enact um, God's his, his will specifically. And that is, as we go through our lives and as we are praying and as, as we are, are, are searching what God wants for us, and, and we realize, you know, of course, it, it, it is through the Word of God, but as we are praying for God's leadership in our lives, there are times that God wants something specific for us. He wants us to do something specifically in church. And it may be something that God is leading you to do that he may not be leading me to do. Or he may be leading me to do something and he may not be doing, uh, leading you to do something. And so this passage that we read, um, this is that enacting of God's will specifically for each and every one of our lives. But in order to understand it, what we have to do is go back and look at verses 1 and 2 again about how we don't need to be conformed to the, the pattern of this world, but instead we need to be transformed by the renewing out of our mind. And to do that, we've got to yield ourselves as a living sacrifice. But in addition to that, one thing that we need to do is that we really have to have a, a good recognition about who we are. Okay? Let's take a look at verse 3. In verse number 3, it says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And so to, to understand that specific will for our lives, to understand how God is leading us, the one thing that we need to do is we need to be sure that we have a good uh, idea about who we are. We don't need to be thinking of ourselves as, as what it says right here, more highly than we ought to think. I think it is uh, kind of a trap that is um, that a lot of Christians kind of fall, find themselves falling into is uh, a trap that somehow um, we, we wind up thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. 
You know, we think that um, we have some kind of special thing for God, uh, that God has some sort of special purpose for us. We think that we're the only ones that can do it. We think that we're indispensable and, and um, you know, God has, has some special plan for our lives. And, and when we start to do that, we need to understand we're, we're falling into some uh, a very bad territory because um, it seems like when Christians do that, um, we start to become very prideful and we start to become very arrogant. And we start to, to, as what it says here, we start to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. And uh, I think that our, our society as a whole kind of contributes to that, don't you think? It seems like more and more today we have a, a, an, an idea, at least as society, is that as individuals, we are indispensable. As individuals, we are, uh, you know, top place. As individuals, you know, we, we are just something really special to God, and God just, you know, puts us on a pedestal. Um, but really, when you stop and think about it, that's not the case. You know, I hate to break uh, this to you, but nobody, nobody is indispensable in the Lord's work. You know, I'm not indispensable in the Lord's work, okay? As a matter of fact, when I start to look at who I am, um, I, I, I really am not all that impressed with what I see. You know, when I take a look at who I am, what I see is I really see a failure. You say, well, what do you mean a failure? Well, when you stop to think about who we are in respect to God and who we are in really respect of what God has created us to be as far as humanity, we're sinners. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So here is God's glory up here, and because of our sinful nature, we fall short of that. And when you stop and really think about it, isn't that a failure? It really is. God had a purpose. God had a place for the creation of humanity. I mean, He created Adam and Eve perfectly in the garden. And because of that sin, and because all of us have fallen short of that, that glory that's there, then you can see right off the bat, um, we, we, we're, we're losers if you want to be bluntly honest about it. And so if that's the case of who we really are, why is it that all of a sudden we start to go through our lives thinking that we're great and we're special and that God has this great and, and thing and, and, you know, if, if we don't do it, then God's just going to be so hurt and lost and upset. Well, wait a minute, you know we've got to come back to where we really are. You know, we, we've got to start to not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. We are not in this upper ethereal category up here. We are just simply sinners that are saved by God's grace, and we live by God's grace, and we live by God's mercy. And if we didn't have that in our lives, we would be destined to hell. And so, everything that we have is by what God gives us. And we need to remember that. Now, having said that, we also don't need to think of ourselves more um, lower than what we really are, too. I think that some people will say, well, you know what, if, I, I, you know, uh, if, if all I am is just a, a failure in the Lord's uh, kingdom, then, then what in the world am I even doing? You know, why? I, I don't even see a point and a purpose. And I, I see some Christians kind of going that way, too. They're just saying, well, you know, I, I can't do it. You know, we need somebody to teach. Oh, I can't do that. Well, we need somebody to go with. Well, I can't do that. Well, we need somebody. Well, I can't do that. You know, and a lot of times I think that, uh, you know, in opposite to making thinking more highly than we are, you know, oftentimes we might have a tendency to think of ourselves more lowly than what we are. And that is that we think, since I can't do this, therefore I don't need to start to think about what God wants from me. I, I'm just simply here. I'm just taking up space. I'm just waiting for the Lord to either call me home or come down here to get me. And uh, that's all that there is to it. I'm just here. Well, no, that, that's not really it either, is it? Because if we are going to be thinking ourselves with sober judgment, 
if we're going to be looking at ourselves and looking at our life about who we really are, then we're going to be thinking about, okay, if this is who we really are, let, let's understand some things. First of all, we're not great. We're not wonderful. We're not indispensable. You know, there's, there's, there's none of that. You know, we are sinners. But at the same time, we're sinners saved by the Lord's grace, and the Lord has something for us. And the Lord can enable us to do something that He wants for us to do. And so don't go, and if you want to think about sober judgment there, you know, sober judgment is going to be that we, we, we come down off that high horse, but at the same time, it means that we come out of the gutter, too. And that we just simply view ourselves as being somebody that with the Lord's grace and with the Lord's mercy, He can use us in His kingdom, and He really can. I mean, when you take a look at some of the, uh, the great people in the Bible, you know, like, for example, Paul, or like, for example, Moses, or people like that, um, you know, we oftentimes think, oh, those were great people. And, but at the same time, understand that these were people who um, the Lord had to deal with and the Lord had to, to um, um, enable to do everything that they did. I mean, Paul was somebody who went around and, uh, you know, uh, suffered tremendously for the kingdom of God. Paul was somebody that the Lord used mightily to spread his word, right? But at the same time, we take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, and we see that Paul said that he was the chiefest of sinners. Okay? And so here's the idea that Paul didn't consider himself more highly than he ought to, but at the same time, he understood that it was by God's grace that he was enabled to do the things in the ministry that he did. Moses, you know, we look at the Old Testament, we say, man, Moses was really something. But keep in mind, when Moses was called by God to go and start that work, where was he? He was tending sheep. And when God appeared to him in the burning bush, what did he say? And What did he do? Call somebody else. I can't do it. Right? You know, it's only by God's grace that we're able to do any of these things. And um, when we start to understand that, then we can start to make traction. OK, now, one thing that we need to understand is that enacting God's will is mainly done through the local church. When I say mainly done through the local church, what we're going to read here is the idea that these things are done through the local church. Some might say, well, you know, I know somebody who is, you know, has this ministry and they're not in a local church, you know, or somebody say, well, you know, are you saying that if, if nobody is, that, that, that God can't use them? No, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is that in the idea about God's general will, you know, God wants people to be in a local church for the planned purposes of doing all these things that we're about to talk about. Now, reading in verses 4 and 5, what we see is this. He says, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Okay? So, here we've got Jesus' body. Now, on a side note, when we look at the Scripture, what we see is when we hear, uh, read about the body of Christ, we're really talking about two different things. We're talking about either, number one, we're talking about Jesus' physical body, that, that physical body that He uh, had nailed the cross. And number two, we're talking about the local church. And so this, when we're talking about the, the uh, body of Christ, we're talking about metaphorically in this body. Now, when we look at that, it kind of makes sense because we look at verse number four, the very first part of it, we see that it says this, just as us, uh, each of us has one body with mem members, um, we can take a look at the idea about a church and we can see that with a church we've got one body, but we've got a whole bunch of people that are different in different walks and everything like that in different functions too. So when we take a look at our, our physical bodies, we've got a physical body and we've got different parts and each part has different purposes and different uses and everything like that. You know, we've got a hand and and a hand's not going to do what an eye does, uh, at least not for the same extent. I mean, I know that 
you know, if we walk into a dark room, uh, we're like, right? You know, trying to use our hands as eyes because the eyes don't work very well. But at the same time, the hands can't see everything that the eyes see, all right? And so, you know, you got a hand. It's not the same function as an eye. And at the same time, an eye is not the same function as a foot. And the foot's not the same function as, say, a stomach is. And, and so on and so forth. So that you, you, we kind of understand that when you got a physical body, you've got all these different parts and all these different functions. Now, at the same time, when you take a look at a church body, a church body is comprised of members, and these members should have different uses and should have different functions. I mean, when you think about uh, diversity within a local church, uh, a diversity as far as a diversity of, of um, you know, background and a diversity of educations and diversity of, of, of likes and dislikes and everything like that, I mean, that can be an advantage to a church. Now, as far as diversity in a church, you know, the way everybody needs to believe the same, and then there, there needs to be that commonality. But everything else, I mean, if you stop and think about it, um, not everybody has the same um, um, desires, not everybody has the same um, 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 strengths, not everybody has the same weaknesses in a church. And when the Lord goes and puts different people in a church, it's there so that the whole body can go and function as what God wants them to be and what God wants them to do. You know, when we take a look at the last uh, very first uh, uh, verse number four, we see that it says this, that we has one body with many members and these members do not have the same function. And so in a church, not everybody is going to have the same function and not everybody can do everything too. I mean, there's going to be sometimes in church that certain people are able to do certain things a whole lot better than another person. You know, I know for myself, um, there are times that people can do things that I just simply, I, I've got a weakness to do. You know, for example, Marge, here we're going to, two times that we're going to use you as an example a day. You know, Marge's got a great idea about, you know, being able to contact people and, and check in on people and everything like that. I mean, she called me earlier this week, and I, Marge, I still appreciate that, you know. Now, I'm just not good at that, okay? I can think about things, and I do think about things, and I think, oh, yeah, somebody's having a hard time, and I'll remember to pray for them and everything like that. Um, and then later on, Shannon will say, well, did you call them? No. <laughs> did you text them? No. Why not? I'm just not good at stuff like that, you know? And I'm really not, okay? And so you can see that the Lord has different people to do different things. One person can't do it all. I can't do it all. Pastors can't do it all. You know, sometimes we, uh, people oftentimes think that within a church, it's the pastor that does everything and everybody else doesn't do anything. But that's not the way that it should be. A pastor should have a certain function that the Lord has placed for us. But that means that everybody else has functions as well. OK, but at the same time, we've got to remember we're all part of each other. In verse number five, he goes on to say, so in Christ, we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. Here we've got this this synchrony of things that the Lord is just working it all out, this symphony of, of differing people that are going and making hopefully beautiful music to the Lord if we are doing what our part is, if we are searching out God's will, and if we are doing what God has for us. And so if you think about it, this is really what church should all be about, isn't it? I mean, oftentimes we think of as church, at least when we say we in terms of modern society, I think that many times people think of a church as far as just simply a religious business, okay? It is an, an, an organization that is there that provides religion, whether that religion is traditional religion, whether that religion is contemporary religion, it's just simply providing a certain amount of religion for people. And people come to church in order to consume that religion, right? 
And so, hey, I'm there, I'm consuming this religion, whether it's a traditional religion, contemporary religion, doesn't matter. It's just simply, I'm there to consume, and the church is there to provide it, and that's all that there is to it. And within that, there are just certainly, you know, certain people that do certain things, and that's all that there is to it. That's what people's main concept of what church is today, but what I'm saying is that that is not a biblical concept. When you look at this right here, you see the biblical concept. You see that the church is a body. And what we see is that Jesus is the head. And so that's what's most important. But all of this body has function. And Jesus determines what that function is. And when people do that function, then God can take that body and direct it for his work and for his kingdom's work. Okay? Now, at the same time, you have to understand, God has a whole bunch of bodies all over the world, right? And so, we don't even have to worry about the biggest picture of all. We just simply have to worry about what our part is as far as our church, number one. And number two, what is our role and what is our function in this church? And how is God leading all of these things together? You see, the point to all of this is just simply this. We need to be sure to just simply do what the Lord wants for us to do and how the Lord is going to strengthen us and how He is going to empower us to do it. Now, if you take a look at verses 6 through 8, what you notice is that Paul lists all kinds of different gifts that were there. But the one thing that I want you to notice is that all these are given by God's grace. That's why they're gifts. They are roles, functions within the church, but they're gifts because God is giving us this in terms of His grace. In verse number 6 he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him do it in proportion to his faith. Now, stopping right there, we need to understand that there were at one time supernatural gifts like prophecy and speaking in tongues and healing and so on and so forth. Those were passed away with the completion of the Scripture. But what we need to also understand is that just because the supernatural gifts passed away, that doesn't mean that there are non-supernatural gifts as well. When you look at the rest of this this list here, these are things that are, are not supernatural. Prophesying, speaking in tongues, things like that, those are the supernatural, but these aren't. For example, if you go on down to look at verse number 7, it says, If it is serving, let him serve. Okay? So there's nothing supernatural about that, but at the same time, the same power that enabled the supernatural gift can also enable the non-supernatural gift as well. It goes on down to say, if it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. And so here we've got all of these gifts, and the idea here is that we need to do it, right? And as a matter of fact, we need to do it in proportion to our faith, which we're going to talk about in just a second, but we need to do it. And to a certain degree, we need to do it, and we need to actually try to do it. You know, there are some times that people um, will kind of, uh, you know, think about something to do in church, and they'll just kind of do it a little bit. You know, try to test that a little bit. It just kind of peters and falters and goes by the wayside, and then that's it. You know, they're they're at this state of not doing anything, kind of doodling, and then it just trickles back down to, to, to not doing anything. You know, if the Lord is leading us to do something, then we need to do it. And that is the purpose. And that's what he's saying here. And that is, if he says, if it's contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. You know, if the Lord is leading us to do something, we, we've got to put our effort into it. We've got to put our all into it. You know, it's not good enough to just simply say, eh, you know what, I'll do it. I go to church on Sunday. I'll do it Sunday between the hours of 10 and 12. Yeah, okay, that's good enough. Well, no, I mean, it, it needs to be really a part of us if we're really going to do it. You know, that is, if it's leadership, govern diligently. If it's mercy, let him do it cheerfully. In other words, we really need to do it, and we need to do it with our all. But whatever God leads us to do, we need to do it in proportion 
to our faith. Okay? So, what we see is that if we go to verse number 6, it says that if anybody, if his gift is prophesying, let him do it in proportion to his faith. And they list all the other gifts as well. You know, we can say that that in proportion to his faith works for all the other ones too. I, I just think that, you know, Paul was on a roll and, and the Holy Spirit was inspiring him and he didn't want to say in proportion to his faith, in proportion to his faith, in proportion to his faith, because all of those things are assumed. And the reason why we say it's assumed is when you go back to verse number three, you notice it's starting out, we need to view ourselves in sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. And so when we start to look at ourselves with that sober judgment, then we can start to see what God's doing in our life. That is like a measure of faith. And so let's just kind of say, for example, that here we are, we're saying, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And God all of a sudden gives us this measure of faith, all right? And, we, and, and you know, faith is intangible, it can't be measured, but let's just say he gives us two gallons of faith. Okay, so we got two gallons of faith, all right? So what are we going to do with that two gallons of faith in terms of our serving God? Well, it, we, we could just simply put them to the side, right? Or what we could do is say, you know what, here are these two gallons that God has given me. I'm going to use it in the area that God wants me to do it. And that is in proportion to our faith. When we start to try to go beyond it, then all of a sudden we're thinking ourselves too highly, right? You know, there are times that God says, I want you to do this, and this is all I want you to do. And that, that, that's it. Don't worry about anything else. If you're a foot, don't try to go and lift weights uh, like a hand or an arm would do. If you're, if, if you're you know, an, an ear, don't go try to, to, to run a marathon. And just, you, you know, you, you do what you got to do. You know, you, you stay within your lane and you take the proportion of your faith and you apply it to what you're doing. Okay? And so this is what we've got in terms of church. And, you know, there's oftentimes that people will go through church and say, well, what can I do? I want to do something. What can I do? Well, if, if you come to me and say, what can I do? I might know of some kind of job, <laughs> you know. Well, you, you know, we can have, somebody can take out the trash, something like that. Um, but really what you need to be doing is you need to be going to the Lord and you need to be praying about it and saying, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? What is my plan? What is my function? How and what is my role in, in terms of, of, in this case, friends and faith and, and really, you know, your kingdom's work? And it could be something that we might think of something small and we might think of it as something that's insignificant. You know, we may think of something like carrying the sign out to the road. Is, well, it's not a big deal. Okay, but, you know, if the Lord wants you to do it, then do it. You know, if the Lord wants you to go and make phone calls to people and encourage them, then, then, then do it. You know, if the Lord wants you to, uh, uh, you, you know, take financial sense and apply it to, to you know, the uh, balancing the books, then do it. If the Lord wants something as simple as, you know, going around and sweeping up bugs, then, then do it. I mean, that, the idea is that we look and we think, okay, what does God want me to do? And as we start to search these things out, I think that the Lord starts to say, yeah, I want you to do this over here. I'm leading you to do that. And if that's the case, then we need to do it in the proportion of our faith. We need to give it the things that God has given us. That is the proportion of His grace. We take that grace, that faith that God has given us, and then we just go about doing it. And when we do this, then the Lord's able to take us and lead us in everything that we need to do. And so rounding things up, just, um, you know, what is it that God wants you to do? What is God having you to do? You know, if we go and we say, okay, I want to know God's will. I'm going to seek God's will out. And we start to understand what God wants for us specifically to do, then let's just simply allow His Spirit, allow His strength, and allow His power um, to do it. 
You know, of course, we need to know what God wants for us, generally speaking. Again, you know, we look at verse number 9. Verse number 9 applies to each and every one of us. It, 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 you can't just skip it out and say, well, no, that's not for me. Maybe that'll be for me next year. No, it's, it's right here, right now. Okay? But at the same time, there are things that God leads each and every one of us to do. And we don't have to worry about what somebody else is doing. We just need to pray that they'll take care of it. And we just see need to concentrate on what God wants and then do it by God's power. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything you've given us. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for um, your word. And we thank you for the guidance and the direction that it gives to us. Lord, we ask that you would please be with us. Help us to understand what your will is, generally speaking. Help us to understand your word and how to apply it in our lives. And we also ask that you please be with us um, specifically. Lord, we are your body. You are our head. We ask that you would just um, take each and every one of our members and make us um, be something that you want us to be. Lead us and guide us and empower us to uh, fulfill your plans and purposes of God's work, your kingdom's work here on this earth. Lord, we ask that you be with us. We also ask that you be at the lost. Help them to understand what it means to be saved before it's too late. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.